Hello, everyone, and thank you for choosing to spend the next hour with us for our webinar, Protecting Microservices APIs with 42 Crunch Firewall. We appreciate you. My name is Kristen. I'm the head of marketing here at 42 Crunch, and today I am joined by our field CTO, Isabel Mani. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Everyone's going to be muted during the presentation so we can avoid distractions. If you have any questions about the webinar, please uh, put them in the Q&A. Sometimes I'll get some in Q&A and chat and it's hard to go back and forth. So if you have questions that you wanna have addressed, then please send them in the uh, Q&A. We will address all questions at the end of the presentation. And if you have a question unrelated to the webinar, you can put it in chat directly to me and I'll help you out with whatever that is. This session is being recorded and it will be sent out in a follow-up email to everybody after the webinar. And we'll also include a link to a blog with all the Q&A. And if we didn't get to a question on the webinar, it'll be in the Q&A. Now, um, I will turn it over to Isabel to get this thing rolling. It's all yours, Isabel. Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are uh, in the world. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're going to spend some time in the next um, 40 minutes or so to give some time for the questions at the end, talking about uh, threat protection, API threat protection in a distributed world and especially in, in a Kubernetes world. And I'm going to start basically this presentation explaining a bit you know, the different concepts and secure around API security. One of the reasons I want to do this is as we work with many different uh, prospects and customers, it's common, there's a common confusion around API security and what it is. And, and, and frankly, it's becoming kind of an over abused world already. Like everything is an API and, and security is a lot of things. So I just want to kind of set the stage here where we fit in the overall picture uh, across all the different processes and things you have to do to actually achieve API security. So what are we talking about here in, in loosely coupled architecture or distributed architecture? Something similar to the, the picture you see now on the screen. Basically, I have different microservices. Some of them will be dedicated to manipulating some data and processes and preparing some information for the next layer, which will be like a more processing controlling layer where I would maybe assemble, transform um, my data and processes for presentation. And then I have a front layer that's more what the external world will see and, and hit, okay? Each of those different layers will probably be exposed through some sort of API because the idea of uh, microservices and decoupled architecture is that each of those services is its own world and its own um, development um, environment. So basically it's kind of a black box that can be developed in any language that the team may choose and the only exposed um, thing that basically the outside world is saying, and by saying by saying outside world, I'm, I'm, I mean people even developing the entire application, other members uh, uh, within the enterprise working with different parts of the application. The only thing they will see is this this API that is being exposed. And in there, we have two traffic type of traffic that we have to deal with. We have to deal with something called north south traffic, which typically is the calls coming from, let's say, a web application or a mobile application or a third party system or partner which is invoking the APIs, and what is called east west traffic, which is more like cross communication across different microservices. That's kind of our overall picture, and we'll go and, and talk about this as we progress uh, along the presentation. So, how do we secure API? What does it entail? What, what we have to do? This is really a layered approach. So 
when we look at API security, so I'm, I'm an enterprise, I'm exposing, I'm creating an application, I'm gonna expose this application through APIs. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm a bank, I'm doing open banking, right, let's say. And there are many different layers up, up to the, the level where we are starting talking about the application and the API itself. There's probably somewhere, there's a hardware layer, it might be in your own data center, it might be in the cloud somewhere, but somewhere there is a hardware and a machine that runs and, and, and um, provides us the, the physical support to actually run all of this. This where we look at security at that level, it would be operating system based, looking at the network, most likely physical access even to that machine, okay? And those systems. On top of that, we'll probably have some kind of virtualization layer. So my provider, something that will allow us to better, you know, take advantage of the power of the underlying hardware. And their security will be, you know, how is this hypervisor secure? Can it be abused? And also something which is very typical to the type of application we're gonna talk about, which are uh, image or, or Docker bases, like we have images that are gonna run on that layer. And it's very important, we're not going to detail this today, but to make sure that those images are also secure, making sure that the images that you manipulate, that you download and deploy are images that you actually trust to run within your infrastructure, okay? On top of that, we'll have a communication layer. So we're deploying artifacts on top of that virtualization layer. This is where our services are, right? And we need to basically secure how those services are communicating with each other. We're gonna get in the details of that. And on top of that, we have what's called app level security. This is where my code is, where the data is, this is where my libraries and frameworks that I use to create the application are. So as, as I mentioned in this picture here, the layers we're gonna focus on right now are the communication layer and, and application layer, the two others as kind of out of scope uh, for, for this presentation. So communication layer security, what does that mean? Uh, basically it means, you know, all those arrows I have on this picture that represent data flowing and interactions flowing across all the different components of my application, how do I secure the communication across that. For example, how do I make sure and that if, if you're building such application, this is really a, a best practice and recommendation that you should never go straight from the front layer, which is basically what you expose to the outside world. You should never go straight into the data layer with, which contains all the, the core information and, and processes of your enterprise. You should always go through some kind of processing, controlling, controller layer. If, if people uh, on the call here have been working uh, you know, for some years now, I'm sure you remember the model view controller type of architecture where we need that controller layer that is doing the link between the data, the model, and the view right, the, of, of MVC. So this control layer is what really should ensure and, and always been hit by the front layer before I can actually hit the data. So something needs to enforce that so that somebody cannot be on the front layer and directly invoke this microservice as a hey, which is a, a tends to be a data one. So how are we, you know, that's the type of things we want to do at the communication level. What kind of things do we want to enforce there? We want to enforce, for example, okay, can this service A, like the front one, talk to service B. First of all, is it service A? You know, I have to authenticate the service as being service A and not something else. Is it authorized to talk to service B? So that's the type of questions I can have. Where is service B? So that's another interesting thing, which is, okay, service A needs to talk to service B. It needs to know where it is. So it needs to understand and talk to somebody that has this registry and say, oh yeah, I know where service B is, it lives at that specific endpoint, and this is where you're gonna go and find it. Now, if service A and service B are communicating, is this communication secure? Is the data encrypted? Are we using TLS, SSL across the board, across all the different components of our architecture? Can service A become rogue and start abusing uh, service B and, and making tons of calls to, to it, maybe not even on, you know, maybe it's not on purpose, maybe there's a bug in service A and it starts doing crazy stuff with service B. Can we protect ourselves from such an abuse, maybe at traffic management level? 
how do we protect ourselves from what's called cas cascading failure? So if service B is not answering, and that's the core service that others have to call in order to do anything, how is my system going to react when such a thing happens? Is it going to fail nicely? Is it going to recover itself? Is it going to auto-adapt to take another approach and, and find and, and maybe pop up another service B somewhere, right? If somebody is capable of in, you know, gating into our infrastructure and, and injects a service there, can this service start talking to other services and getting some information? That's kind of back to the authorization uh, part we were talking about. So this is, you know, at a high level, the type of questions and, and enforcement we want to do at the communication level. So how do we do this, right? Well, this is where um, something like a service mesh uh, is actually getting into the picture. Uh, a service mesh was invented in architecture, microservice architectures, so that all those enforcement, all those policies at communication level that you want to put in place you don't have to put them in the code of your microservice. So, so your, your service really should focus on business logic and do what it has to do at the business logic level of your application. But it shouldn't really worry about is service B available? Where is service B? Can I talk to service B? That should be really external to the code because if those rules are changing, you don't want to go and change the code again. Of course, you'll have to repeat this again and again across dozens and dozens of, of microservices. So you want to keep all this information and all those policies which are related to infrastructure outside of your, of your microservices. This has been like kind of a norm uh, across the, the development of applications. And then a service message just something has been adapted and created for this new type of very distributed architecture. And this is where, for example, I'm going to enforce that no, my front um, microservice will not be able to talk directly to microservices A because as part of the policy at the infrastructure level, this is not something which is authorized. So we cannot do that. And there's another component to that, which can be an API gateway that you see here on the left. Uh, why do we have a gateway in there? It's because that's probably the entry point in our application. That's where, you know, we, that's the, the business APIs that we expose to the outside world. And those have to be also protected at the communication level in a bit different way because it's not intra-services communication, it's kind of external communication coming from third-party clients, wherever they are. Okay? So this is communication layer security. Now, something very critical to remember here is you really have to keep uh, respect a separation of concern here. A service mesh really is only concerned about infrastructure security, about this communication layer. It knows nothing about the application. It doesn't know which data is flowing through it. It doesn't know what it does. All it knows is that it has to enforce those policies about how those services are actually communicating. In the same way, a mesh should really not know about the data and the services running on top. The services should not know about the infrastructure setup. So it's a very, uh, you know, separation of concern here about the, the responsibilities of, of each. Now, another um, point of, sometimes confusion, um, and I've seen the same thing as I've been working for quite some time on this when we were talking about the enterprise service bus. Originally, an enterprise service bus has never been a product. It's been a pattern, and, and really a gateway is a pattern. It is not a product. Yes, we have products called API gateways, but really the idea of an API gateway is a pattern from an architecture point of view, which allows me to expose my APIs um, to consumers. That, that's the idea. And those are business APIs. That's not my APIs on each individual microservice to allow them to build up my application. Those will never be seen by the consumers of the application. This is like internal business. But the API gateway is the one that will expose the information, the business APIs to the consumers outside of the, of the application itself. And it will also be the place where probably I will compose some microservices into multiple macro services. Or maybe I will have, for example, um, I have an API to be consumed by my mobile app and an API that will be consumed by my web apps and another API that will be consumed by my partners. It's at that layer that will specialize and, and do this kind of things. 
And it also has this communication level security. It just does it at a different level and on different type of APIs. That's the same thing. Now, okay, so that's infrastructure. That's communication level. So where do we do the application level things? Where do we validate that the data is actually what we expect? At the infrastructure level, we don't look at the data. We just establish that. How do we make sure that our API is not leaking some information, like data that should not come out on a, through a special API or, or exceptions because something went wrong on my application, on my API, and I'm now leaking some exceptions that leak a lot of information about the internals of my application. Um, we are using um, probably some type of tokens, of access tokens, to allow our um, external consumers to talk our, our business APIs or even to pass some information that contains business level information across the different um, microservices, such as what well, Isabel has been doing in this call and that's her role and all the claims, et cetera, so that my microservice can take a decision on whether they can show me some information or not, or what information they can actually show me. And, and also at, you know, from an authentication and authorization level, here we're not trying to authorize and authenticate which microservices it is and whether it can talk to another microservices, but at business level, at the application level, we want to enforce, does Isabel have access to a resource that's called 1234? Um, that's a very different, so it's still authentication and authorization, but at a very different level. What we were talking about before was really at infra level, now we're talking about application level. And this is the layer of application level security that we really are focusing on as for to crunch and, and I want to dive in uh, right now. So within application level security, there's really two type of um, solutions that you want to use, okay? The first one that you may are using already today is related to API access control. So this is all this access token management, access to my APIs or my business APIs, authenticating who is the user, authorizing access to data, as I was mentioning before, identity management. This is the realm of solutions such as API management and, and identity management. This is what they do, it's what they were built for it, for doing all this governance basically of the access to the APIs. And on the other side, you have um, something which is completely focused on threat protection. And that's really what we do. We're very complementary to the type of solutions like API management or identity management in the sense that we're going to focus on this content validation, to token validation, making sure that the requests which are getting to you are actually the requests that you're expecting, the data you're expecting, that the responses that you're sending back are the ones that you're expected to actually return, um, doing some traffic management at that level, uh, making sure that you protect yourself from abuse, and we will talk about this in a minute, abuse on certain operations of your API, for example, and something um, maybe which is very specific to 42 Crunch, um, and we've seen being used a lot in things like open banking or healthcare. So any type of APIs that manipulate sensitive information, which is payload security. So it is very often not enough to just encrypt the channel. So to go over TLS, which is really communication level security, but also to actually at the application level ensure that the payload of your APIs are either encrypted or signed or both, by the way. So that if you'd make, for example, a, a payment uh, between two accounts, you wanna make sure that this data that you are using with the, you know, uh, making a payment from account ID one to account ID two of 100 euros, um, nobody can just change the target account or change the amount of money that's being paid along the way. Okay, so you want to make sure that this is at least a sign and, and maybe in, in some cases, if the information is very sensitive, also encrypted so that the data that flows through stays encrypted and signed even if you're finishing the, the TLS connection. And also there you, you want to proactively detect potential problems and threats and report on them. So that's, that's what we do. 
uh, the high level within 42 crunch with our API firewall, what we call our API firewall. And where do we fit now in that picture? So we take that picture again, we still have our service mesh, we still have our API gateway, most likely, um, but we're complementing that now with this firewalling uh, functionality that you need again on top of. So there's a lot of confusion uh, when we talk to people say, but yeah, I have a service mesh, I'm already doing you know, all this validation and, and communication, et cetera. Yes, you are just to validate the communication is okay. Again, you're not validating that the application level uh, security is enforced. So when you are propagating uh, some information across within your infrastructure and your different microservices, just make sure that whatever data you propagate is actually the data you're actually expecting. So what we expect is each of those APIs that you see in the picture here have a proper, proper contract defined so that we can enforce that contract. And that's the way basically our solution is working is we're gonna ask you to give us the contract that each of those APIs have. We are going to help you make this contract as good as possible and then enforce automatically what the contract says within each of those firewalls which are deployed. And we can do this as a, let's say as a sidecar model, as you can see here on the right of the picture. So we can sit in front of your existing API and then filter the information coming to it or in a more traditional proxy mode in front of a, for example, an, ex an existing API gateway. So we have this capability. The capability is the same. There's a very small runtime, it's about 20 megs in size, um, so that you know it's being built so you can really deploy it at any point of the architecture without suffering any uh, latency problems or administration problems, and more importantly, infrastructure costs. So that, that's, that's how it works. That's where it would fit in the architecture. Now, before we go on and I'll show you a demonstration, I want to talk about also security principles because that's another um, common source of confusion and discussion when we, when we, we have presentations with, with our uh, prospects is, yeah, but you know, I only want to, you know, I already have all this stuff in, in, in place, plus it, this is internal, right? Um, I really, trust that across microservices, et cetera, I don't have a problem. And, and that's really something you should not do, simply not because, you know, I, I know it's not um, probably um, natural to, to think that internally you're gonna be attacked because you want to trust your employees, but it doesn't mean that they're, you know, you have a rogue employee in there, it may happen, but that's probably not the main source. The main source is gonna be they're being hacked or they're gonna be uh, there's going to be a problem on the infrastructure, their system is being exploited and through them, somebody gets into the architecture. Um, so it's not like it's a deliberate thing, but the, the key thing is you cannot just say, I'm going to make an exception. If you start doing that, you're going to make exceptions for a lot of different use cases and different use cases. You're going to end up with different exceptions depending on who is talking to you. Is it internal? Is it the partner? Is it external, etc.? And what you really want to do is say each microservice basically does not trust the people or systems around it. So all the data that comes into any microservice must be validated as if that microservice basically was exposed to the outside world. You apply the same principles of zero trust to any of the components of the architecture. Okay, first principle. The second one is you should really consider that all APIs are being open APIs. What I mean by this is a lot of people are telling us, but those are internal APIs, or those are APIs I'm not exposing on a developer portal. Uh, I'm just, I have them on the internet, of course, but they're just used by my web application or by my um, uh, mobile application, and I'm not, you know, advertising them. But it, it's, it's uh, you know, basically security by obscurity doesn't work. So the minute you have those APIs on, on a public endpoint, or even if it's exposed internally, they are subject to you know, abuse. 
again for the same principle I was mentioning before. Um, I recently went to uh, a, a customer who was dealing with um, was a truck of money. So basically, there are the people going to the bank and, and, and driving money around. And they have this internal API, which is very poorly uh, protected, or was really pretty protected. We fixed that now, which um, allowed you to know at any point where those trucks were physically, like on, on the map, right? And, and yes, of course, nobody is going to be crazy enough to expose this API publicly so people see it. But this is not something you want to do. So just you know, whatever you do and, and whichever area of, uh, of industry you're in, uh, think about all the APIs you have and use this third point to adapt the security on each of them. So, because obviously this example I just gave is a high risk one. And, and so we, we took this API and we, we, we really uh, changed completely the way it was, um, it was working and, and secured. Now, not all APIs are equal. Some APIs manipulate some data, which is probably not sensitive at all. And you're not even allowing to update this data, right? If, if I'm staying in my banking world, it would be the list of ATMs within my city, right? If I have an API that all allows me to do, and that's actually part of the open banking, all it allows me to do is put a zip code and I have the ATMs around me at, uh, in a 10 kilometer radius, right? And that's only a get, nobody can actually update that. The risk, you know, I could even leave this API open, maybe not put any type of security or authentication on top of it. But if I'm doing those trucks or if I'm doing payments or I'm doing something else, then the security and the level of app level security that I want to add on top of this is completely different. So what I mean is how am I going to authenticate uh, to that API? How am I going to allow access? Am I going to use an API key? Am I going to use uh, OAuth, for example, instead, right? Maybe you don't need to put OAuth with authorization code on every single API you have because the risk is not worth the complication of managing it, for example. So those are kind of the guiding principles around doing app level uh, security. Now, what is special about API threat protection? So for um, many of the people we talk to, what they have done is they realize, yes, okay, I need app level security. I'm not, uh, this is not handled by the infrastructure that I have now. So what they do is they go to deploy something like some kind of firewall, web application firewall in front of their apps, okay, of their APIs and apps. Now, the thing is, APIs are different. And when you build an application based on APIs, the vulnerabilities and the threats you're exposing yourself to are different than a traditional web application. Therefore, you need to take a different approach than the traditional approach you've been taken so far to actually protect any of your apps. And the reason is, again, is because the architecture has changed. And we're back to our picture I was showing before. The architecture now is we'll probably have some front layer in, in Angular or, or such uh, um, type of, um, of frameworks on the client side, on the browser, that has a lot of intelligence and, and can manipulate uh, the API data and, and even filter it and do all kind of intelligent stuff before it actually renders it to the user. And on the server side, only have my APIs that expose some data. And that opens ourselves to a lot of different problems. The first six problems that you see in here are very specific to APIs. We're gonna get into some of those now. Um, so I encourage you to look at this in, in detail. There's been a, a previous webinar by my colleague Dimitri on each of those and, and what they represent and some known hacks around of those. So uh, go back and, and watch this if you haven't and, and feel free to download the, the cheat sheet we've done on this, right? But I'm going to show now um, basically some of the um, actions that we can take in our API for all to protect yourself from, from some of those. So this is the deployment I have um, for the demo. I have um, this API 
that is called a Pixie. If you've seen other demos, you know this by now. Um, simply we use that because it, we cannot really attack and start hacking any known API out there on the internet. So we have to get something we can play with uh, without putting anybody in danger. Um, so our Pixie app here, um, we have a deployment within Kubernetes that has uh, the straight API that runs in its own uh, environment, in its own pod. This API is uh, relying on the MongoDB uh, database. And in parallel to that, I'll have the same application, but this time with our firewall deployed a sidecar in front of it. How does this work? So we have a platform, which is a SaaS platform. Our firewall will register to that platform. It will download its configuration and it will start in front of that API. I'll get in, in a few minutes on, on how this actually works. But before I do that, I want to show you this in action. So the firewall is in here. What I'm going to show you in, in, in the demo now is different calls, either straight to that endpoint, which goes to the API itself, or through the secured endpoint, which actually hits the firewall before it hits um, the actual application, okay? So let me illustrate some of the common uh, problems, some real breaches, okay, that can occur if you don't put app level security in place, okay? The first one, I'm sorry, I'm picking on, on, on the Spur Equifax people uh, every time I do a webinar pretty much, but um, it's, it's a really interesting uh, attack. And that's only, you know, unfortunately for the Equifax guys, it make them go all over the news, but a lot of people were hit by this. But now how did it work? It's actually very simple in a sense because what happened is the attack was exploited through injecting some specific language, uh, NGL language, within a very well-known header, which is the content type header. So that header obviously is not supposed to contain all of this. And the reason this got abused is, well, there was a vulnerability in, in Apache stress behind the scenes, but the key thing here is that framework that was behind the scenes did not validate the content of that header. So instead of just accepting probably application XML or application JSON, um, a user could actually put this entire, so the, 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 the entire block here is actually the content of content type, so the full language and commands, et cetera which allow us in the end to actually become root on, on that system and execute any type of, um, of commands. So let me just jump into uh, demo mode now. So I'm gonna show some Postman here, the technical side of things, but that's the best way to see what's going on when you actually interact uh, with the API. I have um, this API, which is my Pixie, okay. In this API, I can register a new user using uh, this flow. So I have to do a post on this register operation. And this is basically the content of that request. Okay. So if all is fine, I'm just going to send this and it's going to send me a token and if all is good, um, can go and see that this webinar one user has been created. As I said, this is a highly uh, bad APIs that even leaks passwords uh, simply because it's doing uh, select straight from the MongoDB database, which is behind the scenes and returns the entire object that comes from the database all the way to the client. Uh, typical uh, data leakage uh, type of problems. But let's concentrate for now on our content type. So here I have um, on register, I have a header, which is my content type, which is application JSON, okay? Now, if I'm trying to put something as innocent even as XML, I'm not, not to mention any type of scripting or anything like this as we've seen on, on the Equifax just now, this is actually going to be blocked because this is not what we're expecting. And if I look at our platform now, and I will see, that this request got blocked because the content type is not in consumes. So 
So how is this working behind the scenes? So behind the scenes, I said some time ago, we are using a whitelist of everything the API is supposed to accept. How is this working? Well, we actually use an open API, aka Swagger definition to do that. And in that um, definition, it says consumes application JSON, which basically means the only thing this API will ever accept as input is a JSON. I can try any, any content type I want here. It is not going to go through because the only thing that this API is configured to accept is actually application JSON and nothing more. Okay, so that's, that's very um, basic, um, I would say, validation in a sense, but which is protecting you from any kind of abuse related to content type. And you would mention, okay, so I was Equifax. Who else is actually trying this on? Where are people trying? So I just wanted to show you, sorry, something else, which is um, this API security um, um, pen testing, um, I would say, spreadsheet. Right, so this is something uh, a gentleman who's been working on the OWASP uh, top 10 has been creating, where he's kind of helping uh, people who are learning about pen testing uh, APIs to, um, you know, what they should try, basically. And, and one of the things that he's mentioning in there, and I'll give you the link to this uh, within the, the references of the, uh, <clears throat> of the actual um, um, resources, I'm sorry, of the application of, of the presentation, is you know, try to send some content letter, try to send some crafted, um, crafted uh, content type values to see if you can guess what the actually API is doing. So that's actually a measure for, for uh, something that hackers would do. They would try to um, send all kind of requests which are outside of what your API is actually supposed to support to fetch some information and learn from the answers what the API is actually doing, okay? So you want to make sure you're protecting yourself from such type of requests which are outside of the contract, again, of your API, to make sure that uh, such phishing for information can actually not happen, okay? So that's one, one um, type of attacks at application level that we want to, to block. What else do we want to um, block? Pretty well uh, known uh, Uber, um, so this is not a breach, right? This is something that somebody has found through uh, there's a white hacker, uh, and you can uh, read all about it here um, on this link I have put, where um, we've been, it's a very common problem again. App level security, it's not only about filtering the data coming in, which is pretty common in, in, in natural, so okay, some bad data is gonna come in like this content type or some bad data in the body, the JSON is gonna come in like an injection and we want to stop it. But there's also the other way around, which is making sure you don't let data you don't want to come out, you know? And in this case, there's something, what happened here was uh, through phishing with the phone number of an Uber driver, uh, um, the white hacker who did this was able to retrieve, uh, trigger an error message. And within that error message, uh, retrieve this UID, which is basically the unique information about, you know, unique identifier, I'm sorry, about the, the, the driver itself, which is something which is supposed to be, you know, internal and never exposed outside. So you really don't want to have this kind of, um, of things coming in there, um, this kind of information being leaked, okay? Now, in terms of, um, once he had, uh, sorry, that UID, then he was able to use another uh, part of the API to then retrieve pretty much the entire information about the Uber driver, including the actual token that is given to the driver when they log in from the application um, to authenticate them to the actual um, application. So huge and massive uh, data leakage here, right? So how do we prevent ourselves from that? Well, basically we have to take control of our schemas and take control of our information. 
And if we are back to this, uh, to our uh, Pixie application here, this API has an interesting uh, behavior, which is that when um, you log in, even if you are not an administrator, you will be able to get the list of every single user within uh, the, this MongoDB. Right? This is all fake data, obviously. Uh, but and not only because this, date, this API has this problem that it leaks passwords and different things, I actually know that this, uh, not only the user ID and the password, I also know who is an admin and who is not. Okay? Well, that is a major problem, obviously. And again, this is kind of common in the sense that like this mass assignment and mass returning of information is very easy to do in modern application um, development frameworks. So if I'm doing the same thing now through our firewall, what will happen is that this will instead be blocked. And the reason it will be blocked, I'll go back to my log here of what's going on to the system, is because the system is going to detect that the schema um, tells, tells that only name and, and um, the email, et cetera, should be coming out, but not password. So that response here does not correspond to the actual schema uh, of, the, um, of the response and therefore is being blocked. So we're blocking and preventing this information from coming out, okay? Next um, interesting use case would be the other way around. So we've just seen that our API tells us uh, who is an admin or is not. We've seen in the response here, it says is admin equals false. So then this something said, okay, hmm, if is admin is false, uh, is there a way I can do the thing the other way around as a hacker and do a post and saying is admin is true. And it turns out uh, that it's also pretty common um, to be able to do this and do this mass assignment, basically. So that happened very quite recently uh, with the Harbor registry, which is an open source uh, Docker registry, where it was found that you could very easily, just by one call, uh, become the registry administrator, which has all kind of uh, potential problems behind to start overloading images with your own and that have malware in, inside. I mean, you understand what the implications can be. And the, the problem is there is you could actually do this as is admin true. And what the application would do behind the scene, it will just take this full JSON payload and use it as is to update the database in the back. And this is exactly this uh, Pixie API as exactly uh, the same uh, type of problem, right? So I can do something like this, say, uh, this is my email, this is my name, and is admin true? So if I do this through direct again, and I send this, right, it will tell me user has been successfully updated. And if I get the information about my user now, it will say is admin is true, all right? Now, if I do the same thing through our firewall, this is going to be blocked and we're back to our trace here. We will see that this has been blocked because we cannot send the field called is admin because this, this time on the request, we've been blocking the actual access to that. So the only data that can actually come in in here would be the email and the name and nothing more. And this is the only information that I put, then this will go through with absolutely no problem, all right? So those are app level type validation, you know, that can, all, that can be done directly within uh, the firewall by just leveraging the actual definition of the API. So behind the scenes, just to explain you, we'll, we'll just pass on this for now explain how this works now. How did we do all of this? Uh, how did it work? So the idea is of, of our platform is to say, we have this open API file, the swagger file that defines what the API is actually doing. And that is what we are going to use 
from in a positive security model to define what the API and the firewall will accept as, as input and output. So rather than trying to guess basically which data is actually not valid, what is the data that comes our way? And this can be done with massive regular expressions, or maybe it can be done through, through AI with, with some modern uh, systems right now. We really don't need to do that because in the API world, we know exactly what the APIs do and we have a standard way across the entire industry to describe what an API is actually doing. So we took this approach of saying, other than telling us what we don't want, just say, this is what you know, my API does and we will do the work of making sure that whatever it does not match that information will actually be protected. And we can do this on any API within your Kubernetes environment. Should it be those microservices API we talked about, or should it be the business API exposed through an API gateway, for example? That's our full list. And not only that, the other huge advantage of taking this open API approach is that this is what the developers work with. So rather than you know, waiting quite late in the life cycle for the API, the security to be considered, what we want to do is to inject security as early as possible in the life cycle so that you can apply the security and put the firewall in place on any environment. And frankly, I would put it in place as what we saw as one of the recommendations also of the top 10 is make sure you don't have some test environment, some QA environment, some non-production environment, which is not protected because that is another entry point into the system. So you should really protect them all the same way. So if you inject this uh, security as early as possible in the life cycle, then you allow for those systems, development, et cetera, to be protected um, as early as possible, okay? And you're gonna detect those problems also very early in the life cycle, which makes them much cheaper to fix in the long run, okay? So um, the, the runtime that we have, right, um, that I show you doing those validation as really being built to be deployed in such environments and to, to build a zero trust architecture. So it's a very low footprint. It can fit in multiple use cases. It can be deployed as a sidecar. It can be deployed as a reverse proxy. It will run in any type of cloud on on-premise, public, uh, private uh, or hybrid uh, combination um, and, and, can be com and will be compatible with either your existing uh, monolithic application microservices or, or even if you're using a service mesh. So that, that you can very easily deploy this app level security across your entire uh, Kubernetes deployments, whichever type of applications you have chosen to actually create. And that's um, uh, what I wanted to um, cover today. Um, and uh, we'll be opening it for questions if there are any. Thank you, Isabel. Um, at the moment, there's no questions. I'll give you guys just a minute. Uh, we have one that came in. Can you share more information on your sidecar proxy? Isabel, are you there? Yeah, sorry, you 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 had you had muted you had muted me. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. I'm sorry, myself. please do. Uh, sorry, I thought you left me. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I'm here. Um, so more about Psycho Proxy. Yes. So this is you. You mean at a technical uh, level, or um, let me let me see if I can focus on. So basically, it's it's um it's a small um, firewall image, right? And its job is to sit in the architecture at the, next to the APIs. What it will do is it will intercept basically the calls to your API and it will filter those calls based on this open API definition, okay? 
So within the platform, what you have is a, a set of services. One of them will help you take your existing open API Swagger definitions and fix all the potential vulnerabilities and problems before you actually use it straight into configuring um, the actual sidecar proxy. So you can simply deploy it in front of your API um, and, and then manage it as you would any other uh, element of your um, Kubernetes environment. Does that answer your question? Let's see. Next question, the sidecar, can it be tested somehow? Yes, um, just before you deploy it, I, I assume that's what we, we did. So this is something we are um, finishing right now, but yes, the idea is before you actually uh, deploy your sidecar, um, you can validate that the configuration for it is actually valid and your sidecar will actually start up and then uh, deploy it. All right, next question. Do you have pre-configured template for Kubernetes admin API? We have some predefined uh, templates um, to deploy it. So we have a Helm chart that you can use to deploy it in proxy mode. In sidecar mode, it's a simple addition to your existing um, YAML files and, and definition and deployments. Um, and then you can couple that with a cert manager if you want to man manage the, the certs and HTTPS on top of it. So there's, there's very little to the, to the deployment itself um, in terms of administration. We, um, we don't have yet like some specialized, like an operator, for example, this is something we're looking at doing. Um, we don't have a Kubernetes operator yet. Um, that's something that we, we want to do on, on the roadmap. All right, next question. Do you have 100% coverage of the OWASP top 10? That's interesting. Uh, nobody can claim that. So I'll tell you why. It's, it's, there's a lot of different aspects to, to this. So me alone as the API firewall, um, I cannot tell you you're 100% covered on all the watch and nobody actually can tell you that. Simply because in there, for example, you have security misconfiguration, right? So you, we, we as Fortitude Crunch will make sure there's no security misconfiguration in our part. But for example, if in your application, you're using some bad libraries that you downloaded from NPM and it turns out to have a CVE, you will still have a problem from an OWASP point of view that does not, nothing to do with, with 42 Crunch, okay? So you really have to take a step back on this and look at the entirety of your application. And for each of those entries in the OWASP, look at the impact of the different entries in there on your application such as, oh, I have to validate, you know, that all my libraries are actually fine and I have a CVE. Or I have to validate that the VMs and images that I'm using are actually proper. Or I have to validate that my, all my endpoints, the QA, the dev, and everyone are actually cataloged and known and secured, right? So we can help you, but we cannot guarantee, and nobody can, that we cover entirely for your entire application the OWASP top 10. I want to make sure this is clear because there's so many claims of like, we do 100%. Um, you know, I just want to be honest here and you have to look at this, you know, holistically, okay? All right, next question. Can any language or any language supported for developing policies as code or is it only open API translated policies? Okay, that's an interesting one. So um, basically the core of the configuration of the firewall is open API, okay? So that's, the, that's kind of the base. Now we also have uh, extensions, which are also in the open API file. So for us, the open API file is really the center of the configuration of the, of the security. So we have our own extensions to add, for example, um, security headers injection or, or JWT validation or rate limiting or all kinds of different security only type of uh, policies. We will deliver those with the product 
And if you want to create your own, we have our own language, which is basically JSON based, where you have a bunch of um, building blocks to create your own assertions. And then that's the creation of the the creation of the policies, I'm sorry. And then those policies you will engage from within your open API with specific extensions, okay? Like X42C, you know, um, JWT validation and pass some parameters in there. That's the way it works. All right, we have time for one more. Um, if the API contract is not available, let's say developers don't maintain it or it's outdated, how do things work? Ah, well, we need one. We absolutely need one. Um, there are uh, ways to uh, create and, pr and, and build an open API file uh, as a starting point. Okay. Now, within the platform, there's another service I haven't talked about, which is called the conformance scan. And what this service will do is starting from the open API, which is your contract you can use it to invoke your uh, actual implementation and see if there is a discrepancy, uh, if those two are aligned or not, okay? So um, you will have to use external tools to have a starting point, but then uh, we will help your developers and we'll help you keep that file up to date and keep the implementation in line with that contract. So we have a, um, a lot of different tools, also plugins in, in VS Code and, and, uh, and plugins in different CI CD systems to help you keep that, uh, that file always up to date and the system up to date. All right, thank you, Isabel. Um, we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, there's a few questions we did not get to, but we will answer those and they will be posted to our follow-up blog. So I'll make sure that you guys get the link to that and all your questions are answered. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to close out with, Isabel? No, uh, thank you very much for everybody attending and um, um, don't hesitate to ping us back and request a, a demo or more information and we'll be more than happy to help. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you, Christine. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody.